Joining me on the Closing Act Music Entertainment Program are two special guests, Jason and Rhonda Helbert, R.J. Helbert, husband and wife team, behind the best-selling book, Caretaker, book one of the Good Pastors Chronicles trilogy. Mm -hmm. And when they're not writing, um, Jason is an Emmy and Grammy award-winning producer, songwriter, longtime music director and producer for The Kelly Clarkson Show, and Rhonda, 10 years as a successful music and TV manager, photographer, cook, and they're here today to talk about their best-selling book, and I'm so excited to have you here, and welcome. Thank you so Thank much you. for having us, and that just sounds wild when you say all that, so I'm not, <laughs> not used to... Uh, being authors, yet alone um, having a successful book. So, wow, yeah, <laughs> thank you for having us. Yeah, so did music, having a successful music background, did it help in writing the book? I don't know that it helped us in the actual writing of the book. Um, uh, we um, have had no ex previous experience writing and, and we can go into how that came about. It did help us a bit in, and how to get it out into the marketplace. I mean, some of the some of the same um, ideas of how you get music out to the world definitely translates into the book world. Um, but you know, it's been a huge learning process for us, and it's certainly um, our fortune and blessings in the music industry have given us a leg up to getting our story out to a wider audience. Um, but the actual book writing process was so different than writing a song or producing music uh, in a very exciting way, but completely different. Yes, the reason I ask because it has music like the Carpenters, We Only Just Begun, and it's so, it's so, I love it. It's unique. Um, and that's why I thought, wow, that's, so I, I would like to ask you, what was the reason for writing the book? Yeah, we, um, our, our family went through a very tough season of life for about three years, starting in mm -hmm. 2020. Um, which we know that was the beginning of COVID and everybody was affected by that. So we don't feel like our story is any special. Um, ours just started there and then kept going down. And we ended up having a lot of great loss in our family. And um, I mean, just to make the running list really quick, um, losing aunts and my mother and a nephew and mm -hmm. several like 10 plus people to COVID, another friend to cancer, and then Jason's mom. And it just kept going and kept going. And then the, the final thing that just really took us under was we lost our home to a flood. Um, getting out of that process of sitting in your pain and sitting in your depression, um, that's really hard to do when it's that deep and when it's that low. And so a friend of ours just recommended a brain treatment called Saraset. And um, we took our whole family and did it and it actually works. And it brought us to a place where our brain could settle and balance. And in that settling and balance is where actually it, it reopened up all of our creativity. Um, so I, I do give it a lot of credit for getting us to a place to where we could um, be somewhat normal again and not sitting in our depression. Um, but I think, too, like we probably had this story sitting in us for a while and this just gave us an opportunity to um, to pour it out and to then give us an opportunity to focus on something outside of our, our pain. Yes. I mean, and, and, you know, Jason, did you want to add to, to that? I mean, Rhonda covered it. We, um, I just remember the movie Back to the Future, uh, and you're looking at the Polaroid, and people are disappearing out of the Polaroid. And one day mm -hmm. we realized that all of all of the familiar things of life were just gone, and it was just it was it, our our world shrunk immensely. And um, we we both went through some therapy individually and together. A lot of people encourage journaling, um, which. Yes is is a Rhonda's good at that that that's a difficult outlet for me um kelly um who's gone through a lot of um trauma in the last few years and some personal things she's able to get that out through songwriting so she actually suggested that i try writing some songs 
I wasn't able to separate my producer mind and my song. Like as I tried to write songs, it was hard to separate the writing for radio or what the sounds were like. So that wasn't an effective outlet for me. And after this brain treatment, this story started forming in my head. Um, um, and I found that writing this story, putting, creating some characters that we're familiar with and putting them into some similar situations but letting that story unfold was so therapeutic for us. So rather than mm -hmm. Ron and I talking every morning about our grief, we were sort of pouring this into this world. And it's actually a fun story. I think you've read the book. It's not as heavy as we make it. The genesis of it's very heavy, but the actual telling of the story, um, it's it's a lot more fun, you know, than the story. But the story that got got there, um, it it I we say that it saved our lives. It, it was just it was a it was like a pressure valve of just releasing all this grief in a way that we could come together as a couple. Because a lot of times trauma can tear families apart. And Rana and I have been married 31 years, and this is an entirely new challenge. And rather than it pulling us apart, we actually joined together um, to tell this story. Mm -hmm. Yes, like music heals, if I may say, in writing. Yes. So we have the best, right? And it is very inspirational and I have to ask you, what what it's what was it like working together, like writing together? Being, I guess you're you travel a lot. You both of you do. So, what was that like? Well, we we spend a lot of time apart, and uh, it, yes. I always joke we've been married 31 years, but we've probably been in the same room for five of it, and so <laughs> yes. that works for us. Um, and and we are completely different personalities, and those two you can see those in the book together um it was if i'd written the book by myself or ron had written the book by itself it would have been a totally different experience mm -hmm. um so I'll, I'll let rhonda you know expand from here but well um basically when when we had this brain treatment we jason came home one day and he was just like i just had an idea and he starts telling this story and instantly I knew that there was something magical about this. So I pulled out my phone and started voice memoing him. I've never voice memoed my husband. That's just a weird thing. But I just felt it like, oh, I need to capture this. So I just put the phone down on the table and we started talking back and forth. And within about three, maybe four hours, we had the entire trilogy all ironed out from beginning to end. It was phenomenal. Now, it took us a whole lot longer to hammer all of that out. And that was the process of our writing where um, I do spend at the time, Jason was at the TV show in L.A. and they've moved to New York since then. But um, I did spend half my time in L.A. and then I have to spend the other half of my time here in Nashville um, because we are trying to rebuild that home that we lost. And so I'm having to babysit, you know, the, the construction of that. So in that distance, we would um, share voice memos or we would I would sit there and type everything up and I'd say, is this what you meant? And this is how I saw it. And what do you think of? And then we would just shoot it back and forth to each other. And that took about a year and a half to hammer all of that out and to make sure that we got all the details. And I will say Jason is probably the best at laying all the Easter eggs. And I feel like my the gift that I brought to the table was the supernatural and the family. And I think Jason was all about the sci fi and the Easter eggs and all the different layers. I hope that people read this book and they catch all of those layers because Jason worked really hard on them. Yes. yes. Jason comment. <laughs> yeah, it was um, this the the idea for the book. I remember I flew home to Nashville after um, I, I was on a trip. Um, I think I was in Utah and I was playing for another artist named Colby Calais. He was one of my favorite artists. And this was right in the middle of just a ton of loss. And I took a day to myself, went hiking through the canyons. And it was just one of those moments where I went back home that night to the hotel and I just felt like I'd had a moment to myself and I could breathe. And I started, I woke up at two in the morning to text and all these phone calls coming in and my house was flooding. And it was just sort of that gut punch of really, like you just, you finally breathe and, and, um, and I flew home the next day, I canceled my trip, flew home. And I remember standing with Rhonda over uh, the foundation of our home. And when I say the flood destroyed our home, it destroyed our home. And it exposed some foundation that was, our home's over a hundred years old, but just rotted beyond belief and growth in the floor. And some of those pictures are actually in the book, the inside cover is actually from our foundation. 
And um, it, out of a moment of desperation, I just threw my hands up and I'm just, you know, you're, I, I just, I remember looking up and saying, okay, we're going to rebuild this. But I was like, God, if, if while we're, while we rebuild the foundation of this home, would you please rebuild the foundation of our lives? Mm -hmm. And it was this idea of what if we could, what if there's a story where we could actually do things in the physical that would actually affect our lives? It was, you know, it was very sci-fi. It was just like, you know, if you, if you need children, what if you build a nursery? Like, so it's created this thing where the physical was connected with the metaphysical and that's what started the journey. And so it started as a fantasy, but through the process, we've actually learned to look at our lives a little bit differently. And we're sort of incorporating some of the truths that we've learned in this book along the way. So it's been, um, I've heard a lot of songwriters say that songwriting, you just sort of download, it just comes to you and these songs are fully written. That's almost how this book happened to us. It was just like in that three or four hour period, there was just a download and something for us to hope, hope for. And, you know, they, they tell you to write what you know. So we did start this book with characters that we know and familiar with. But as the story developed, these characters took out their own personalities and they actually approach things differently than we would. And so it's a weird thing to look at our own writing and we're seeing, wait, this is how the father handled this situation. What if we did that in our own lives? And it's actually been a very mm -hmm. cool process for us. Yes. I mean, it's it's a, a page turner, as I said at the beginning. And, and you know, so there's a it offers the reader um, supernatural. It's a thriller, right? It's a mystery. It's therapeutic. It's science fi. It's it's everything that um, it's just a wonderful read. And and it went by so fast. Like I'm reading it, and the, and it's there's symbolism in there too, right? There's the, well, if I'm at the bees, so I and and so you like bees, right, Jason? Yeah, we uh, started beekeeping. We moved back to Nashville. Rhonda has severe allergies, and somebody recommended local honey. And Rhonda's allergic to bees, so I took on the task of being the beekeeper. And we lost all of our bees in that same flood, too. It was sad. We lost about 20,000 bees, and I miss those girls because they were, uh, or those boys, those little workers. Um, yeah, it, it, was, um, they, it was very therapeutic for me. And um, so we, again, we everything in the story, even the most, fantastical things are based in some form of truth. We just really stretched it. Like like the yes. scene you're referencing with the bees, uh, we were remodeling a house in California. We found a 50 pound honeycomb in the walls. Honey was oozing out of the walls and we thought, ooh, that's mm -hmm. great. We worked that into the book. Um, all the yes. symbolism is we had more fun researching these things. Every name means something. Every, mm -hmm. you could go deep on the book, uh, every, every character, every situation. You can read it on three different layers. There's um, you know, one of my favorite books is The Alchemist, and I, I, I love the allegorical approach um, to storytelling. And so you can read the story just as it is, or you can read it with a lot of allegory. And there's a lot of hints as to what's to come, because the entire trilogy, um, at the end of book one, we end on a cliffhanger, and book two opens up yes. in an entirely different setting. And um, mm -hmm. it's going to be, it's a fun journey. It's a, we're writing a book that we, that we want to read and we want to watch. Um, a series or a movie that would come out of that so yeah yes i mean yes it is a cliffhanger and and you know you're writing the second one right you're <laughs> so yes. as we speak um but yes yeah, so there's a digital version too right um yeah and i'll let uh, ronna speak to the music we um the, the exciting thing about the digital version is there's actually links so you can listen to some of the songs referenced in the book while you're reading mm -hmm. it and including lyrics in a book um we came from a place, again, we've never written a book before and music's a part of our lives. So we started including yes. lyrics. Our editors, and you know, we had three different um, rounds of editing. Everybody said, you have to take the music out of the book. You can't have lyrics. And we're like, well, why not? We license songs all the time for our TV show. And they're like, that's a different license. You can't do that. It's really hard to get. Um, Rhonda never takes no for an answer. She's the one as my manager. She's like, it never hurts to ask. So, um, <laughs> so Rhonda took that on. <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't know. I, you you only have a no if you don't ask. So um, I asked them out and found out that, you know, yeah, you can print, print lyrics. It costs some money to do that. And that might be why traditional publishers tend to say you can't do that because it does cost um, more money. 
But to us, the music was so important to telling these stories. And we live our lives through music. We live our lives through lyrics. They mean something to us. So it just felt like putting a piece of us into our book. So for us, it was <laughs> worth the investment. So we did get yeses for all the songs that we wanted. And I personally feel like that they help tell that story. And I think they tell it well. And music is so interwoven in our DNA. I couldn't do it any other way. Yes. And that's why I asked you that question at the very beginning, you know, because it's like you have Fix You by Coldplay and, and you had everyone come on board, right? And Kelly is, is involved as well, right? Yeah, she's so, going to be uh, voicing one of the characters. We have a very ambitious audiobook, and um, I, I'm an avid reader, but I've actually never listened to an audiobook. So in doing research, I listened to a few audiobooks and I just didn't enjoy a narrator just reading all the characters for me. So I told Rhonda, like, we have to voice this. So we went after, I put together a wish list of all of our favorite actors that we thought would be perfect for it. And they all said yes. And we're working on the audiobook now. We have music in it, it's being scored um, by an incredible composer. Um, we have incredible actors involved in it, and they've really brought this book to life. It's like listening to an old 40s radio play. So we're working hard on that. That's going to come out probably beginning of October because um, it's quite an undertaking. But um, yeah, we're so excited about that. Oh, that's just wonderful. And, you know, I'm just so excited for the next, right? I mean, yeah, so I, you know, there's a lot of research involved, right? And that you were talking about or saying, I should say. And but what has the feedback been like? Can you share with our audience? It's been for me and Jason, it's been shocking, um, but the feedback's been so good. Um, you know, we wrote this story for therapy for us. It just helped us to process our own trauma. Um, the beauty of that is the hope is we captured some of that process and have maybe created another tool for the rest of the world. Um, and that's the feedback we've gotten back is people are reading it and they're seeing um, hope and they're seeing a different way of thinking and a different way of processing. And man, if that's all this book does is just give people hope that that's yeah. all I need. That's all I need because that's what it did for me. And it mm -hmm. saved me and it gave me hope and it pulled me up out of that dark pit. And man, if that can do that for someone else, then it's, it's absolutely all worth it. So yes, the feedback has been astounding, shocking. I, it was what we hoped for, but now to hear it has just been really so good. Oh, and Jason, any comments? Well, and it's, it's the feedback has been from several, just as we wrote the book, we're getting feedback from some people who have just really been attached to the story. Some people love the family aspect of it. Some people are really attached to more of the mystery and the supernatural parts of it and really called them Easter eggs. We've had a lot of um, people reach out that have also suffered grief and have seen some of themselves in this. So that's just been very rewarding. Um, and all of our insecurities as first time authors, um, there was one author, um, Tosca Lee, and way early on, she gave us encouragement as writers and said, hey, this is good, this is worth doing. And that really gave us the courage to move forward. So um, mm -hmm. it, it feels odd where you know, after 30 years of music to tiptoe into somebody else's world. We're not trying to be experts. We're, we're well aware of our limitations as writers, but the reception we've received from the writing community has been very encouraging. And um, it's, it's, it's made it a lot easier for us to continue with book two and three. We have a, a little bit more confidence now moving forward and are excited about it. Yes, and you know, I have to ask, I wanna just add, why did you choose Boston? <laughs> um, Boston was important. Um, Ron and I, we, we grew up together in a small town in Texas and we made a pact early on that we were going to leave the small town and go out into the world. Um, and we were dating in high school and uh, Rhonda broke up with me our senior year, broke my heart. Um, <laughs> and during that brief time of senior year, I thought about giving up music and I had a, I had a scholarship to Boston University and uh, spent some time there getting ready for that. And Boston's just a place that our whole family loves. Um, we, again, we wrote from what we knew, but we wanted to place the family. We didn't want them to be in Nashville, so we wanted another small town, a big city to a small town move. And we just love everything about New England, um, especially with my family are all British. Um, 
and still live in England and spread over Europe. So we just love the New England setting. And so mm -hmm. Austin is very special to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, listen, Rhonda, did you? <laughs> Well, that, I mean, that, that nails, like, we, we, <laughs> we love to travel and we find our favorite places and we always go back. Um, my family is Irish and Boston just has, you know, the huge Irish influence in it. So mm -hmm. that's why I connected to it. Jason connected to it because he thought he was going to go to college there until, it, until we finally got back together. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful town. It's absolutely designed uh, like an, like a England, you know, and so I guess that's why they call that whole area New England, because it's it just looks like yes. that. And it brings us back to feeling places of home, either in my Irish heritage or his British um, background as well. So it's just a beautiful town. If you haven't been there, everybody should go visit. Yes, that's wonderful. And like if people want to find the book or buy the book um, and where can they go? You can, um, the best place to start is rjhalbert.com and you can find links there to every place. Um, um, it's been, after our appearance on the Kelly Show, we sold out of stock nationwide in the US and Canada. And so we've been quickly trying to get that <laughs> restocked. Um, so we are available on Amazon. <laughs> Amazon's out of stock on our normal way, but we've found a workaround. We have another store selling our books there. You can get direct sales from us and then the ebook is also available on Amazon, but Barnes and Noble, um, all over the place. So pretty much anywhere you can get books, um, mm -hmm. they, I think they're available. Some are on back order right now, but don't let that stop you from trying. <laughs> yeah. stock, stock has already been shipped, so we're just waiting for them to receive it and and put it back on the shelves. So <laughs> wow, it's just it's just awesome. And is there anything else you like to add? Uh, I, I think we I think we covered everything like the whole the whole story is such a um, it just it's such a passion for me and Jason. We have absolutely loved being authors, creating together, telling this story of hope. And like Jason said, that one moment of grief of going, OK, if we just focus on rebuilding the foundation of this home, which we are focusing on right now. It's time to um, let that reflect a rebuilding of what we've lost of, of our family and of our community. And so that's what we're that's what we're hoping for, is that um, all of this will come back fully restored and will be um, a connection point for all of these new people who are going to be reading the book. Well said. And well said. And that's, <laughs> thank you so much. For being on the show. I had such a wonderful time interviewing you and congratulations on the book and then Thank two you. and three. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We'll make sure yes. you're one of the first people to get a copy of book two so that you can yes. see it next. Oh, I would love that and autograph it too. So, <laughs> Of course. Consider it done. <laughs> I'm excited to have with me on the Closing Act Music and Entertainment Program international renowned Jagpreet Bajawa, who is an Indo-Canadian classical folk and rock singer and a composer. And he's also sings the Canadian anthem at the Vancouver Canuck Games and Whitecaps, as well as the U.S. anthem at the Stanley Cup Finals. And he is here to talk about his background, a little bit about his music background, which is a stellar music background, I should say, and about the Wingspan program that um, I'm so excited. And welcome. Welcome, Jeff Preet. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be on with you. And uh Hello to all the viewers watching. Yeah, so I understand your passion for music started at five and your first performance was at six years old. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, <gasps> no. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, um, uh, I'm 29 now, so it's like, you know, 23 years of my life um, have been sort of dedicated to, to music. And I mean, there's really been no looking back ever since that first performance um you know it's it's really lucky to be um in a career like this you know from 
you know, a lot of times when you have childhood dreams, you, your dreams change so constantly. But for me, right from the beginning, it was always music. And I'm, I'm so glad that stuck with me for, you know, since, since that age. I mean, it's amazing. And you're such an inspiration to many, you know, um, following your dreams. And just to add, you speak 16 languages. Is that I sing in 16 different languages. Yeah, I've, I've, I've sung in 16 different languages and, um, you know, it's, 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 it's great to be a part of, um, you know, to, you know, I've, I've always believed that music really has no language, you know, it's, um, um, it, it's so universal and, uh, the, the knowledge of language really helps in understanding, you know, obviously the, the meaning of the lyrics and everything, but I think, you know, the way we express, um, when we sing can really tell the whole story without even really having to understand uh, what what the the language is sometimes. I have to ask you, how does it feel to be an inspiration, a role model, but also singing in front of, you know, at the Canuck Games and, and performing? Like, I understand it was like uh, over 500 stages. Is that is that right? Like, or more, I should say. Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, now it's been over oh. 1500 now, but I mean, it's, it's very, it's very kind of you to say, um, I've never really looked at myself as like a, like an inspiration or anything like that. I, I mean, it's, it's really kind for people to say that, you know, I've always wanted to sort of spread that message, um, of, of inclusion and, and, and love throughout the world and through, through the music I'm doing. And I'm, I'm just so glad that people have responded to it so well. And, you know, I think the people around me, um, you know, like like yourself and 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 so many other people have been the inspirations and the catalysts uh, for for me to, you know, really continue and 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 do what I'm doing. So um, it's 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 so surreal to to be singing at uh, at different stages and on different platforms. From you know, obviously Sadegamapa, which um, if you translate that into English, it means Do Re Mi Fa So, but it's um, it's based out of India. And it was uh, equivalent to American Idol. It broadcasted in over 165 different countries uh, around the world. Um, so to reach the top three in that competition with millions of people watching around the world and obviously doing the Canucks and white cap stuff, it's really been a dream and, and a dream that, uh, like I said, it's, it's from all the support around me that that's gotten me to this point.